Marky, please. Number two, camera roll 12, channel seven. Okay, so, are you ready? Uh -huh. So tell me about that rally that you went to the first one. In 1931, I was sent to Germany on an exchange fellowship from the University of Wisconsin. And um, Hitler was coming to power, and I heard that he was going to give a lecture in the big hall. It was called the Messehalle, across the Rhine in Cologne. I was living with a Jewish family, and when I announced that I was going to hear Hitler, they were ready to kill me or explode with fear and said, you can't go, you're a naive American, you mustn't put yourself in such danger. And I said, oh, nothing will happen to me, I'll wear an American flag in my lapel. And off I went, knowing that I was giving them heartaches, but I had to see what Hitler looked like, I had to experience a Nazi rally. And it was horrifying, terrifying. I sat there with my knees shaking so loudly, I was sure that one of the SS men would hear it and throw me out. There they were in this huge hall, completely decked with Nazi flags, with swastikas, and the marching of the men. You could hear the boots marching, and they kept singing and shouting, and there was, they were sending shockwaves of hatred across this hall, and then Hitler came, and it was as if the Messiah had come. There was such excitement and joy and, and people raising their hands to greet him, and his speech grew more and more hysterical. His voice kept, get, kept getting higher and higher, and he ranted against socialists, against communists, against the Treaty of Versailles, against Americans, and always against Jews. It was, it was a, a really a growing experience because in many ways it shaped me. I knew that from then on I would have to do whatever I could to fight this man, that this was the greatest danger, not only to my people but to the world. What, what do you think it was? Okay. A different question. Camera 12, channel 7. Okay. What, what do you suppose now, again, placing this in a time it was a depression, and I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about that and what it was about Hitler. That, what was his growing appeal to people? What was it that, that, that kept bringing people to him? He reached out to first to the dispossessed, in the small towns and found that that was the way to go to them, to promise them jobs and work and employment and beautiful future. Then he reached out to the farmers. Then he went into the big cities and not only reached all the dispossessed and the unemployed. Twelve, general seven. Want to stop? Okay. Okay. So let's try again. Why don't you tell me again what what Hitler's appeal was to the German people in the thirties in that depression? It was a period of great depression in Germany. In the early years after World War One, the Great War they called it, not World War One. After that period, the inflation was so high that people had to put German pounds, German marks, into a baby carriage in order to buy a loaf of bread. You could buy a Stradivarius violin or a grand piano for a few hundred dollars. People were selling everything just to stay alive. By 31, the inflation was already under control, but there was still a depression and a lot of unemployment. So Hitler reached all of these unemployed, the lumpen proletariat who didn't want to work anyway. And he began in the small towns and the villages. And he was very smart. Hitler did everything legally. He First he went to the small towns, then he went to the big cities. Then he entered every single political race 
until he was able to reach his goal. And, and as he reached out, he went from the lumpen proletariat, from the unemployed, to the bankers and the industrialists, and he promised them that he could create the kind of Germany they wanted, a Germany in which they would really be the masters, so that he was able to reach the whole spectrum of German life. And even people who sort of him as a clown, Charlie Chaplin with a little mustache, still listened to his siren songs, and particularly when he blamed everything that happened in Germany on the Jews. They were, anti-Semitism was so endemic in Germany. So what was, what was the promise? What did he promise the people? He promised, first of all, that they would all have jobs that they would all have fine homes, that farmers would be able to sell their produce, that people in the factories would get good jobs and then they could live well. He had a promise for every single group inside of Germany. And the promise was always couched in terms of, we'll get rid of the Jews, they're our misfortune. Die Juden sind unser Unglück, he said. And he said, if we get rid of the Jews, we get rid of the communists and the bankers. He had them fixed. They were both the multimillionaires who controlled everything, and they were also the communists who were going to overthrow Germany. You took whatever you liked. What was your reaction, your personal reaction? I know you weren't there at the time, but when you, after you came back to the United States and you found out that Hitler had become chancellor, what was your reaction to that? It was a period of mourning for me. It, the Weimar Republic. Okay, the, excuse me. When you start that, can you tell me when you heard, you have to how oh. did you say back the question to me, when you heard that I, Hitler came, became chancellor? I see. What, and, and again, what happened to you personally, physically, on the day that you found out mm. what was in this curious letter? When I returned from Germany, Hitler had already won a good many victories politically, but he was not yet chancellor. When he became chancellor in January of 1933, I was sitting in my little studio listening to the radio, and I heard that he was now going to run Germany. And I sat there mourning the death of the Weimar Republic. It was as if a country that I had grown to love while I was a student there, even though I knew its dark underside. But it was this country with the great writers, Beethoven and the musicians, you know, Beethoven and Bach and the writers like Goethe and Schiller and the poet Rilke had died. Everything that was noble and beautiful in Germany suddenly died, and Hitler destroyed it. And you just sat there? And I sat there weeping. It was the way you weep when a beloved parent dies or a beloved friend dies. It was the death of Germany, and I knew it. I knew it in every cell in my body. When you went back to Germany, what was it, what was it like to enter to cross the border and go into Germany at that time, and how was it different from the first time you were there? When I went back to Germany in 1935 on another fellowship, I was making, a, I'd been sent both by the New York Herald Tribune as a correspondent and on a new fellowship at the recommendation of the Guggenheim, the border was immediately a, an instrument of terror. The Germans soldiers in their uniforms, in their shiny boots, entered the compartment in which I was sitting. They demanded my passport, of course they always do, but then they demanded that I open my suitcase. They held everything up to the light. I felt as if they thought I was a spy. What were they looking for? I wasn't smuggling anything. I was going back to see what had happened to the Germany I had once loved. And it, it it must have been the same for every foreigner, as well as every German returning there. It was a moment in which they wanted to instill terror into your bones. And what had happened to the Germany that you once loved? What, what was your sense of it when you returned? And the Germany I had once loved had turned into a Germany in which wherever you looked, there were swastikas flying, reminding you of how the Germans 
were going to thought of themselves as conquerors. You saw these flags waving. You saw troops were constantly marching down the streets. I was in a bookstore in Cologne, a bookstore in which I had so frequently gone to buy books when I was a student at the university there. And everybody was browsing around. Most of the books had swastikas on them. Hitler's Mein Kampf was everywhere as if it were the Bible. And suddenly, everything went still. They turned on the radio, and Hitler's voice came into that bookstore. The same hysteria that I had heard when I went to hear him in the Messehalle in Cologne. And the people stood there, again mesmerized. And his hysteria was mounting and mounting. And all I could think of was, how can a people as brilliant as the Germans, people who had created so much, love this tyrant who was going to drag them down? 13, sound all seven. Okay. So describe to me again that, that day when you went into the bookstore after your return. I was in Cologne, and I went to the bookstore that I had used all the time. I was a student in Germany. It was a bookstore I loved. And now most of the books were with swastikas, and Hitler's Mein Kampf was the centerpiece as if it was the Bible. And I was browsing around, and suddenly everything went still. The radio was put on. Hitler was making a speech, and the people stood there mesmerized. And I wondered, how could a people as bright as the Germans listen to his hysteria and the things he was saying? And the voice kept getting more and more hysterical as if he was talking out of his belly. And then the, he, he finished, and the radio stopped. And the people went back to browsing as if nothing had happened. And I walked out on the street. And suddenly I found myself being crushed by a mob of people. They were watching soldiers walk down the center, down in the gutter. No, no cars were allowed. And a man next to me said, oh my God, it's my neighbor, and she's Jewish. And I started talking to him, and he said, first they rounded up the communists, then the socialists, and now the Jews. I said, where are they taking her? She was carrying, she was, sort of helping an old man, and it was as if her life depended on protecting him. I didn't know who he was, I didn't know who she was, but she was moving along with him. And I said, where will they take them? And he said, to some kind of camp. We still didn't know about the big camps that he was sending them to. Okay, and, excuse me, I'm not, yeah. real, I'm not clear again. When you walk you out, stop? no, keep going. Okay. When you walked out of the store, out of the bookstore. What exactly was going on in the street? Were there people? I didn't quite get a sense of, of who was pushing whom around, what was... Well, the... Okay, apparently, start again with yes. when you walked out of the store. When I walked out of the store, I saw a lot of people lining up on the sidewalk. And I went to see what was happening. And I, then I found myself being pushed closer and closer to the front and in the gutter. Soldiers were marching and they were bringing an, a woman with her apparently a father or grandfather, an old man, and several others. And they were shoving them along, herding them as if they were herding cattle. And I, a man next to me said on, in a very low voice, oh my God, it's my neighbor. And so I turned to him and I said, who is she? What is it? And he said, first they rounded up the communists on our block, then the socialists, and now they're rounding up the Jews. And I said, where will they take these people? And he said, to some kind of camp. We didn't know yet about the death camps, and of course they hadn't yet become death camps, but they were already building camps in Germany, and they were taking them to camps in Germany. Thank you. When you were in Germany at that time in 35, do you recall, did you, what sorts of signs, out, visible signs in the street were there of anti-Semitism, of se segregation of Jews, or any, was there any visible, you, you talk about seeing swastikas and flags, yes. is there any anti-Semitic 
graffiti or signs or what, what, how, how did that manifest itself? There were signs in some of the shops that said no Jews allowed. There were uh, Jewish shops that were boarded up already that they were making people move out of. You had the feeling all around you when you walked down those streets that if you were a Jew, you were in danger. They were going to get you somehow, and they, they forced them out. Thank you. Um, now, I think, was this also in the same day you had an encounter with a woman at the Jewish community? Do you have, okay, we have to cut. We have to cut. We have to cut. Samuel 7. Yep, Mark. When I left Cologne and I went on to Berlin, I was still searching to find out what was happening to Jews and what was happening to women. And I went to see a woman who was sort of the head of the welfare department. She had an office right next to the famous synagogue called the Oranienburger Strasse. And she was very suspicious of me at first. She said, who are you and why have you come? And I said, I'm a student and I'm a journalist and I want to talk to you about what's happening to the Jews. She said, you're an American, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she said, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? Why would you come to Berlin now when we're in such danger? Why have you come? And I said, because I, I want to know what's happening. I said, why don't Jews leave? If they can get out, why don't they leave now? And she looked at me as if I really were very stupid. She said, of course they'd all like to leave. But do you know what your country, America, demands before they can get a visa? You have to fill out a document that's a foot or two long. They make you, and, and anybody in America who wants to sponsor you here has to fill out this document with their whole life history, their bank account, their taxes, everything. They have to prove that, that you won't be a burden to society there. And many of the relatives don't have the kind of money that are needed, or they don't have the room. It's almost impossible to get a visa now. It may take years for any of us to get out and get a visa. So what are you doing here now? And again, I told her that why I was here, and I was writing articles. And she said, you want to know what's happening to us? She said, we would like to leave, but many Jews, like many people, are, can't move. She said in German, wir sind unbeweglich. We're immobile. She said, picture your father. Could he just pick up his roots and run to another country? Some have a little property, and they're hoping that something will change. They've lived through other crises, and maybe something will change. And they don't have to leave, so they're holding on to the property or the little store or something that is tying them to this land. Because don't forget, Jews have been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Their roots go back to Charlemagne, maybe earlier. So how can some of them pick up roots? But she said, you're a young woman. Don't stay here. You think being an American with your passport will save you, will protect you? Because when I was leaving, my mother, of course, was terrified that I was going. She said, they can shoot you. And I said, Mom, they won't shoot me. I have an American passport. And she said, so they can't shoot an American passport? And now this woman was practically saying the same thing to me. She said, your American passport may not save you. They can lie. They can say that you were dealing in the black market, that you were trying to change dollars into cheap marks. They can pick up anything. They can put you in jail, and nobody will ever hear from you again. She said, get out of here. Leave here. But when you go home, and she came around her desk, and she put her arm around me. She said, I have a daughter your age. I wish my daughter could leave. She can't leave. But you're an American, you can leave. Go, and when you go home, scream. Scream so that you can tell the whole world what Hitler is doing to Jews here. Go home, my girl. Go home and scream. 
Will you cut for a second, please? Yes. Team Samuel 7. Mark it, please. Both this woman and others whom I met would say to me, you think things are bad here? We know what's happening in your country, too. You're having a terrible depression. We hear about the anti-Semites in your country. We know how your whole country on Sunday afternoon gets paralyzed because they're listening to Father Coughlin and how he's spewing the air with his anti-Semitic poison. We hear how they're hanging black men on trees in the South. For what? They make up stories that they're raping white women. We know what's happening in your country. And it was uh, many of the Germans who later became Nazis. We have to stop, right? We have to stop. Okay. Mm. We have to change the rules. In the street. Okay, Mark. No Number muggings. Eight. Camera roll 14, Margin. sound roll 8. Not only this woman, but other Germans that I met would say to me, you're having a depression in America too, like here. We read all about your country. We know what it's like. We know about that Catholic priest, you know, Father Coughlin. Every Saturday, every Sunday afternoon, all of you sit paralyzed because he's spewing poison in the air. We know how you have people hanging black people from the trees and say that they raped white women. We know what's going on in your country. Don't tell us what Hitler is doing here. We know all about your country. Um, now, you talked about that you went away and then you came back yet again, foolish girl. You came back and you went to a striker rally. Yes, right? we yes. We have a plane problem? <laughs> Renai, camera 14, sound roll 8. So tell me about the, that, first of all, that you came back in 35. Yes, I came back to Berlin. I had been in the Soviet Union and the Soviet Arctic, and then I came back to Berlin, and there was a Streicher rally. He was the man who published this very anti-Semitic newspaper called The Stürmer. And I had not only a little uh, American flag in my lapel, but I also had the um, thing that they had sent to the newspaper, because I was then with the Herald Tribune, uh, giving us permission to go and cover the rally. And so with that and this flag, I went to this huge rally. There were thousands of people in Berlin. And again, it was filled with flags. They were such showmen. It was, you know, banners all over the Judens and Unser Unglück, and banners about Hitler, and again, these marching soldiers. But this time, I wasn't as frightened. It was a worse rally, even, than the one I had seen in 31. Because, but by now, I knew who the Germans were. I knew myself better. I knew how I had to sit, how I had to protect myself in case they came and tried to arrest me. But I listened to these speeches of hatred, and I knew that this country was going to try to destroy the whole world. Was Hitler at that rally? No, no. This, this was, was a rally. A yes, this was just... Okay. Julius Schreicher. Okay. When, where were you and how did you hear about Kristallnacht? And how did it, again, personally affect you emotionally? What, what were the feelings that you had when, when you heard about that? In the, when I learned about Kristallnacht, I was living in Brooklyn with my family, my parents and my sister and brothers. And we learned how these hooligans went through all the streets of Germany, breaking into synagogues and destroying shop windows and looting and stealing and, and beating Jews on the heads and pulling the beards of old Jews. And we all sat there absolutely sick, absolutely destroyed that in this era, that in this global world, where we were such idealists and where we dreamt of a, of, of a world that would be better and better, that a world we could pass on to our children, that there could be a people who were so inflamed 
that they could do this to one segment of their population. But were you surprised after all you had seen in 31 and 35? Were you actually surprised that this had... That this I, had... I wasn't surprised. I was just sick at heart. I, it was no surprise. Because these things all have a logical conclusion. If you don't stop them here, they go on further, and they go on further. They do greater and da greater damage. That's why we have to stop these things. The minute we see race hatred, we have to confront it and stop it. Okay. Can you describe to me, now coming back to the U.S., or in when, I mean, now we'll talk about being in the, in the U.S., incidents of anti-Semitism that you or your family encountered not just at that time, but I mean, I, in the 30s. I'm thinking about in the 30s, in the Depression era. But what sorts of things happened? We lived in a neighborhood. When I was born, we lived in a shtetl that was all Jewish. And everybody in it was Jewish. The butcher, the baker, the corseteer who made my mother's corsets. I thought the whole world was Jewish. Then when I was nine, we moved to Ridgewood, it was called then. Now it's part of, Bev of Bedford-Stuyvesant, a very depressed area now. But then it was a middle-class area, and we didn't know we were moving into a German town. It was all Germans. We were the only Jews on our block then, and most of the others were Germans. But my brothers played with the boys. I played with the girls. We didn't know what was going to be happening in Germany. But within a few years, we saw the Germany begin to cast its shadow on our block. A few blocks from where I lived on Bushwick Avenue, there was a, a kind of sports arena called the Turnverein. And that's where the German men and women met. And they would uh, ostensibly be doing all kinds of sports and athletics. But actually, it was a stronghold for Nazis in America. And they were marching around there, carrying their swastikas again. Some of them got in uniforms. My brother was the doctor of dearly beloved doctor who took care of almost all our neighbors. He was the kind of doctor if he delivered a baby and the husband would go to the wallet and take out money, he would say to him, put the money back in your pocket, here's some money, and go and get some milk for your wife. So everybody loved him. And the head of the Turnverein told all our neighbors, do not use Dr. Harry Gruber anymore. He's a Jew. But by this time, the neighbors loved him so much that they paid no attention to the Turnverein people. But this was how they were trying to influence Jews, uh, Nazis or Germans or Americans in our country to spew the poison of anti-Semitism. Can you think of any other kinds of things aside from sort of the US Nazi type groups, but just ordinary incidents of anti-Semitism, or was there did you feel, or did people in your family feel, the obstacles of being Jewish in America? Was there obstacles put in your way? Not so much in our way. We went to, for instance, to universities where there were many Jews, like New York University, where I went. My brother couldn't get into medical school in New York, but he got into Georgetown, which was in Washington. But in New York University, where I first started studying German as a freshman and fell in love with my German professor, and that's how my love for Germany began, there was already great anti-Semitism in the German department. Not my German professor, but the chairman of the German department was already a Nazi. And we would hear him walking down the corridor saying, diese verdammte Juden, these damn Jews. And uh, my brother-in-law, Sam Sobel, who became a doctor, was already on the faculty as a, a lab instructor in embryology. And his professor was German, Professor Hüttner, but the kind of German who loathed Hitler and the Nazis. And one day he said to Sam, Look, you're a good teacher, and you're a very good student, and you know the work, but I'm firing you. 
And Sam said, you're firing me, why? And he said, because look around. You love your job, but you will never go higher than that job. You'll stay in that job forever and ever. There is not one Jew who is the head of any department in this here in, in our science group. Not one single Jew. You will never be able to advance. I'm firing you. Go out and become a doctor so you won't be part of this anti-Semitism. Can we cut for a second? Yes, thank you. Okay. And of course then in, in today what's happening is that in 1930s it was anti-Semitism and today it's blatant racism. But we were an <laughs> but we well, were in like there was lynching and there was all that stuff that yeah. everyone was talking about. And, and I wonder if mm. you if you can tell me just what if you felt any any comparison then, again about the thirties, how you would compare the Nazi policies, the anti Semitism there to racism in this country, lynching and Well, there are some people here who think it was genocide in this country, too, that we were out to destroy all the blacks. But, but it, it, we weren't as cruel or maybe as scientific. <coughs> what? It was an economic... Speeding. Camera 15, sound roll 8. Mark it. Okay. So tell me again what it was, what the experience was like on those Sunday afternoons listening to Carver and what sort of emotions it aroused and whether you felt he was a serious... Yes. Sunday afternoons, the whole country seemed to be paralyzed. Everybody listened to the radio and listened to Father Coughlin speaking from Detroit, poisoning the air with, with blatant anti-Semitism. Poison. And, and we felt a sense not only of horror and anger that, that such language could come across the air, but also a fear that he was instilling this kind of hatred into a country that was already overtly anti-Semitic. Our Congress was restrictionist and anti-Semitic. That's why we didn't want to let refugees in. We didn't want to let in the, the whole restriction with quotas and the whole business of keeping certain countries into a smaller number of people who could come in was essentially to keep out the Chinese from the Orient and the Jews from Eastern Europe. When, when you realized how much these people could help America, but yet even the labor unions were anti-Semitic because every, they said, every time you bring in a refugee, you're taking a job away from an American. And that was the reason they wanted our doors kept tightly shut. And that was why we couldn't help save people. When people did write those letters, like the, I mean, I know during the Wagner-Rogers hearings, to get to let the orphans in, yeah. Europe, they're from Kristallnacht and from Europe, to let the, there, were, there were letters like that. You know, they're going to take our jobs away. Was that true? I mean, would they, would they in fact, I mean, it was a depression. Isn't, isn't, wasn't that a valid argument? Of course. We have to think of it in terms of the climate of the time. It was a valid argument because everybody needed a job. Okay, you have to start over and tell me because oh. what was the valid argument because our viewers were Right, now. right. So, so let me just start you off again, which is to say, what, what is your response to people who would say, hey, we, you know, we have to protect our own here. Charity mm -hmm. begins at home. Yes, there were, during these days when everybody was restricted from coming here, there were indeed people who said, if you let a newcomer in, he'll take the job that I might have. And there was some validity to that. But on the other hand, my feeling is that, we, that more, the more people who came in, the better our economy would be because they would bring the needs for more schools, for more roads, for more factories, so that there would not be this kind of taking a job away from an American but the argument that was used was a very potent one. 
Don't let anybody in any jobs that are available give us, give Americans. And it was hard to fight that kind of, of argument. Um, did you or your family try to bring anyone over from Germany? or And I mean, now I'm talking again mm. in the early days, in the 30s. Was there any attempt to get, did, were there any people who tried to, any family members that tried to get in that you helped to bring in? or when, um, The interesting thing was that the re relatives of my parents who wanted to leave Poland then, wanted to go to Palestine. And my father sent them all the famous tickets. They called them Schiffskarten, the ship's ticket. And when one daughter, who, was, who would have been my cousin, left for Palestine, her family sat shiva. They sat in mourning because they visualized her being killed by Arabs. And actually, she was the only one of the family who survived. And they were all, a few years later, forced to strip naked in a Polish killing field and were shot by Germans and Poles. You, um, I want you to tell me, I want to go back to Germany again, because I want, we didn't, we didn't talk about your sister's friend, Norman, in Vienna. Yes. And why he was in medical school there rather than in this country and what happened to his lab. Can you tell me that? You... I went to Vienna and called one of my sister Betty's friends, Norman, who was studying medicine in Vienna. He had applied to all the medical schools in the United States and had been turned down because they all had a Jewish quota. And he was not able to get into any of them, but finally he was accepted in Vienna. So he went there and I called him and he came rushing over, looking thin and gaunt and hungry, and said, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Do you want to go to the opera? you want to go to see Vienna? you want to go to the, some of the beer gardens or the university? I said, I want to go to the university. I want to see where you're studying. He said, I don't think you'll like what I'm going to show you then. And I said, why? He said, wait. And he took me into the lab, and I felt a knot in my stomach. It was as if a bulldozer had entered that lab. Every single experiment had been destroyed. All these beacons, beakers and, and the test tubes lay shattered. There was a nauseating smell of ammonia and sulfuric acid. And, and the floor was littered with notebooks that were torn up. And I said, who could have done this? And he said, Nazi students. I said, students do this? And he said, yes. And they do it to the labs like ours, where they know we're all Jews and Americans. And I said, do the newspapers know about it? Does the university protest? He shook his head and he said, no, it happens all the time. And I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, start the experiment all over again. What else can I do? There's no place else to go. Um, I'd like to stop for a second to change batteries. Sure. As we know, we were talking a little bit before about the quotas and the restriction. FDR refused to take a public stance in favor of the Wagner-Rogers bill and bringing in, bringing in refugees. Um, how did that make you feel about FDR? I mean, what did FDR mean to people? And then how, this public stance, how did that affect your... FDR was so beloved, especially by the Jews, that they, they didn't really react too strongly when he refused to take a stand on allowing orphans to enter the United States, because he had indeed done so much for the country had lifted them out of the Depression, had given them a vision, had, had really changed the economy, that in my mind, FDR was a wonderful politician, but he was a politician first and then a humanitarian. And his refusing to take a stand was a great disappointment. But in the context of all the things that he did, we still loved him. And when he died, you know, the whole country was in mourning. 
but he he was a great leader. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, cut for a second. Absolutely. Nice. We were 13 camera. Oh, just the opposite. Boy, what so, a difference. So did you and the people in your neighborhood, did you listen to the Joe Lewis fights? What did he... The Joe Lewis fight was like a carnival on our block. You walk down the street and out of every open window, you could follow the entire fight just walking because every house had the radio on blasting. And there was such joy because Joe Lewis was really the American. Even with the German neighbors at that time, I don't know how they really felt, but I knew how I felt. Joe Lewis, to me, was pure. He was the great athlete, and he had to win. We all really loved him. Every kid loved Joe Lewis. He was the big hero. How did you feel when he lost the first time? Do you remember that he lost the first time to Max Schmeling? Right. Germany? Oh, we were devastated. But when he lost the first time, we were devastated. But when he won, that was the victory that we all yearned for. That made us all just want to leap in the air, seven feet high. Our man had won. Did you see him? Did you see the fight in a context of American versus Nazi? Did it, was that fight seen that way? Of course the fight was America versus Hitler's Germany. Democratic, pure America, idealistic against evil Germany that wanted to conquer and destroy the world. And Schmeling represented that kind of evil. And Lewis, with his lovely face, and his great talent represented everything we loved in America. And so we won? And we won. But we always do. We defeat evil. Good always wins against evil. And, and purity wins against horror and terror. And Joe Lewis was our dream boy. Actually, I think. Okay. Good. Like Lena Horn is our dream girl. Yeah.